No. No, you had your chance. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> So IT Chapter 2 tells the story of the Losers Club gathering back together 27 years later in Derry, Maine to finally take out Pennywise. Well, the day is here, everybody. IT Chapter 2 is upon us. This was one of my most anticipated films of the year. I want to say it was number three when I did my list last year. It was without a doubt my most anticipated movie for the back half of 2019. And it is now a serious contender, if not holding the crown for most disappointing film of 2019. Yep, cat's out of the bag. Didn't like this one. Uh, I, I'm very, very disappointed with the film that I watched. I actually waited, I slept on it overnight because I didn't want to do this review angry because <laughs> I left the theater very irritated with what I, what I just experienced. And um, so, goes without saying, if you're somebody that absolutely loved this movie and you don't want to hear any negative thoughts towards it whatsoever and this review is just going to irritate you and make you spew nonsense down below in the comment section, this is not the review for you. If you're somebody that wants to hear my thoughts, wants to hear why, as somebody who is a fanatic of the Tim Curry Pennywise and most of the 1990 miniseries and was a huge fan of the first It two years ago, why I'm so disappointed in this film, then stay tuned, because I'm going to get very far into it. This is probably going to be a long review. I'm going to try my best to keep it as spoiler-free as possible. If you're somebody that knows nothing about the conclusion of It, if you've never read the book, if you've never seen the miniseries, if you don't know anything about It's final form or the ritual or anything like that that I'm going to have to get into to a certain degree, then again, this review is not for you. But if you know just enough, I'm going to try to keep it mostly spoiler-free while getting into the details that most people probably expect that are at least familiar with the story. So nonetheless, this movie had big shoes to fill. Like I said, I grew up watching the 1990 miniseries. I have always been a huge fanatic over Tim Curry's performance as Pennywise. I've said this ad nauseum on this channel. There is only two characters in my entire life that genuinely scared the shit out of me. And I've been watching horror films since I was three or four years old. That's Zelda from the original Pet Cemetery, and that's Tim Curry's Pennywise. The only two characters in film history that have followed me into my nightmares as a child. So naturally, I had a big kind of attachment to that performance, and I had very big expectations for when they were deciding to remake that um, miniseries into two films, and they had the Bill Skarsgård version of Pennywise and everything. I have my full review for the uh, It from two years ago if you want to check out my thoughts for that. But kind of setting the stage, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the kids. I really enjoyed how they kind of scaled back the story, got rid of a lot of the kind of mixing the timelines that the book does and the miniseries did and just focus solely on the kids. I really liked what Bill Skarsgård did as Pennywise, but I felt the CGI really kind of took a lot of it away from me personally. He didn't affect me anywhere near what Tim Curry did. And I do still hold true that I think Tim Curry is the more authentic, the more iconic performance as Pennywise because he was terrifying just him. He had no CGI to help him. He had just his physical performance, just his voice, just his mannerisms, and the sharp teeth that to me work a lot better than the, the big mouth of whatever the fuck CG that they try to do with this version of Pennywise. But nonetheless, that was a minor gripe in a film that I really, really enjoyed. So I had big expectations that if you get the same crew back, you get the same director, you get the same studio, the same writer, and they cast a really great cast for IT Chapter 2 as these adult versions of the kids, and you bring back Bill Skarsgård, maybe learn some lessons from the few things that some people, which is mostly the CGI, agreed was kind of a downside in that first film, and you could have a very great chance at delivering an awesome version of the second half of this story, which was not delivered in 1990. So as far as what they got right, the positives with IT Chapter 2, the main one for me is Bill Hader as Richie. This guy was awesome in this movie. He was the name that I kept seeing on like early reactions. Everybody kept saying Bill Hader steals the show. Bill Hader's fantastic. And they're absolutely right. There's a small little negative with his character and the way they utilize him, which I will get into later. Actually, two. 
but overall, his performance, his comedic timing, even his dramatic sense that he comes to with this movie. I haven't seen the show that he has where he's a hitman. I don't know if that's more dramatic or if that's more comedy, but this is the most dramatic thing that I've seen from Bill Hader. I'm usually seeing him in movies like Pineapple Express and Superbad, and he is the best casting. He's the best character in this entire film. Every single time he's on screen, he steals the show. He's got so many laugh out loud moments. He really brings aside the uh, brings out the drama too. Like when you get into the third act and the final act and the climax, when everything starts to go haywire, a lot of the emotional weight for what's going on kind of lands on Bill Hader's shoulders, which is surprising to me. I would have thought it would have been McAvoy and he nails it. I thought he was great in this film. Next best thing to me was the set design. This movie has a much bigger budget than the first film, which I will get into later as well. But as far as the set design, the budget going into designing the Recreating the house from the first movie, kind of making it a little bit more decrepit, the actual lair that they have to go and face Pennywise in, even kind of recreating or doing different things with like the, the house that Bev grew up in. Uh, a lot of the set design regarding that, even, even the little kind of area that uh, the attic and the library that Mike has been housed in for like 27 years, it has like a nice realistic but like decrepit feel to it where it just makes Derry feel like this dying town which is something that they explored a lot more in the 1990 miniseries and why it's a dying town this one it was just more the visual aesthetic and you kind of had to put that together for yourself and I feel like even though they didn't go into it plot wise the visual aesthetic brings that out. You look at it and you go, this town is nothing. There's nothing here. And my third and final positive, I told you I had a lot of issues, is that this movie does have the balls to kill kids. You know, people were shocked at the opening of the first film a couple years ago when they actually showed George getting his arm bitten off and it was very graphic showing the death of a child. There's not necessarily a scene that's as prolonged and as graphic as the Georgie death, but there are a couple of scenes in here, isolated scenes of Pennywise kind of coming back into action where he kills a kid and they show it. They don't shy away from it. They don't, you know, cop out and let somebody save them at the last second. Pennywise kills a couple of kids in this movie, and <laughs> it's very hard to describe this without sounding like a sick psychopath, but I like it when a horror movie has the balls to go there, to not have this taboo safety blanket over children. If you're gonna tell a story about a children eating clown, show the clown eating children, and they do. Now on to my one mixed aspect, which is the one thing that I see universally everybody praising across the board, so I might be in the minority with this one, and that's the casting. On one end, they are brilliantly recreating the facial features of these kids with the people that they casted. Like, they really look like they paused production for 27 years and filmed a movie with the adult versions of all of the kids cast from the first movie. It's almost uncanny, especially with somebody like Jessica Chastain and James McAvoy, these A-list actors that we've seen all the time. And they really look like the kids that were casted who were kind of unknown actors a couple of years ago in the 2017 film. So on that side of things, like the, the suspension of disbelief is amazing it, with believing that these kids have grown up into these actors. There's no block there whatsoever. You immediately believe that these are the adult characters. That's the positive side and why it's a mixed aspect. The negative side is that for me personally, every single cast except for Bill Hader feels mediocre. Even Jessica Chastain, and shockingly, even James McAvoy. And I don't think it's necessarily their faults. I think that they're good, they're good enough. They're just not great, they don't stand out. I think most of that deals with the script and the way that they decide to characterize these adult versions, which I will get into in my negative section, but Bill Hader is the only one that shined to me. I know I'm in the minority with that. I know everybody has loved Bill Hader for the most part, and everybody has loved everybody else, especially McAvoy and Chastain. I just didn't get anything out of them. I've seen so many better performances out of both of those actors, and even the other cast who are mostly, to me, unknown actors that, you know, Mike and Eddie and even Ben just didn't do anything. They didn't really stand out to me. I mean, even like Ben, this is an actor who I've never seen before that I know of, and he just didn't really bring anything to the character aside from, I'm in love with Bev and I'm, I'm afraid to tell her. And again, I think a lot of that is script. So I will blame the script mostly. These are probably very good actors and I know Jessica Chastain and McAvoy are great actors, but this didn't do anything for me. And actually kind of keeping with that, I will say about one character in particular that I do think is kind of a mixed portrayal of that character. Mike 
There was a big negative in the first film with a lot of people that they didn't really give Mike a whole lot to do. And me and a lot of people who have familiar with the story said, wait till chapter two. He's got a huge role that they're kind of waiting to fill out in that second half with the adults. And they do do that here. And he's interesting to a degree because he's the one who has remained in Derry. He's the one who's remained in this decrepit town and the one who has remained knowledgeable of what happened and about Pennywise and about the, the oath that they have given. He's the one that has to bring them all back. That's a really interesting side of his character and he kind of has to drive the story for the first act of the film. But very quickly, he gets regulated to just be in the exposition dump. Anytime they need like some kind of an explanation for what Pennywise is, or how we're going to defeat him, or why we're doing this, the camera just pans to Mike and he gives this exposition dump of details, and that's basically all the character does from maybe the half hour mark all the way through to the three hour mark. Speaking of three hours, let's get into the negatives, shall we? First one, the one that it seems like everybody's in agreement with. There's no reason this movie should be three hours long. It does not merit that runtime at all. This is the basic plot of this movie. Losers get back together, losers try to regain their memories, losers fight Pennywise. And that's three hours. The movie is one of those long run times that you start to feel every single minute by about the first hour mark. There's not very many times, like very, very rare occasion that I will actually pull out my phone in a movie and check the time to see where I'm at in the film. And at the point that I was starting to really kind of lose patience and just start to lose interest in what was going on because it was so repetitive, I pulled out my phone. I wasn't even halfway through the film yet. It, this whew, three hours was punishing in it chapter two. And now one of the big ones that I think is probably gonna get me the most hate in the comment section because it got me some of the most hate in the comment section in my first IT review. I'm putting Pennywise in the negatives in this one. I don't think that it's Bill Skarsgård's fault. I think that he does everything that he can and there are certainly things about this that kind of carries over from the way he was performing as Pennywise in the first film that is impressive as far as physically what he's able to do with his face and the drool and the eyes and everything. That's still awesome. All the credit in the world to that guy for being able to do that without any help. <sighs> There is nothing for me that was memorable or scary or iconic about what Pennywise did in this second half. Nothing. Like the couple of scenes where you get like full on Pennywise action to me pale in comparison to what he did in the first film and really pales in comparison to most of what Tim Curry did in the 1990 miniseries. They're fine. There's not like embarrassing scenes. There's certainly some creepy stuff here and there, but they don't really they don't pop to me. They don't stand out. There's nothing about this where I'm like, I'm gonna quote that scene forever. I'm gonna remember this movie for that scene. There's none of that. I had plenty of that in the first movie. And even the standout scenes, if you can call them that with Pennywise in this, they feel detached from the plot completely because it's just a isolated scene of Pennywise luring in somebody or attacking somebody that has no relevance to the plot whatsoever except for one kid, which is a cool scene with McAvoy in that glass house but they feel, they feel almost like deleted scenes. And that's one of the things kind of going back to the runtime where there is so many scenes in this movie that feels like they don't really add anything. They don't really move the plot forward. They don't really have any relevance to the film or the momentum whatsoever, but they're still here. And when Pennywise scenes feel that way, that's a problem. And there's not even enough of him. Like this is a three hour movie. We get maybe, maybe nine minutes of Pennywise. And a lot of it is him running around in CGI, which I will get into. Hello. And even beyond that, like everything story-wise that they do with Pennywise in this was a huge disappointment to me. The explanations of his origin, the whole explanation of the ritual involved with Pennywise and the deadlights and how Mike was able to get that information to me was a ridiculous scene. They brought back the fucking spider. The fucking spider. I understand the Stephen King aficionados and the purists that want every little tiny detail that's in his writing to go into movies that adapt his writing. But there's a golden rule when you're adapting written work. It doesn't always work on the page the same way that it works on the screen. And they proved that 
30 fucking years ago. They proved that back in 1990, that you cannot do this spider and have it be effective or anywhere near as effective as Pennywise the Clown. Why would you try to do that again? I promise you, if you had spent more time in the writing room and more time coming up with a good enough way to show Pennywise's final form and actually have a good like final battle, much like we had in 2017 with the kids and Pennywise the fucking clown, Stephen King purists would not really care that much. If you gave us a great ending and a great final battle, they're not going to piss and moan that there wasn't spider legs coming out of it. There's a couple of them, but fuck them. Spending two entire movies, almost five hours of runtime, with a clown as your main antagonist and the main draw and the main breeding ground of the fear of your audience, and then swapping that out for a fucking spider in the final climax of this five hour storyline is a mistake. And all they try to do to rectify it the way that they thought they were going to be so much better than the 1990 miniseries, aside from just the time jump and how technology has advanced since 1990, is that it's a spider, but they keep like the torso and the head of Pennywise, which to me, in all honesty, looked even more ridiculous and was even more distracting than the spider in 1990. I actually prefer the spider in 1990. That's fucking disgusting to even say out loud. And if that wasn't bad enough, again, not getting into spoilers, but where they decide to take the story as far as how they actually can defeat Pennywise, how they're able to get him to a form that they can fight, was embarrassing. Like, I can't even put it into words without spoiling it. When you see it, if you're not full on on board for the movie at this point, you might be okay with it, but if you're, if you're like me and you're frustrated at this point, it's embarrassing where they go from the spider. Now moving on from that, the other biggest thing that really pissed me off about how they portrayed this story and how they brought this movie together is what I'm going to now call my three sins of horror filmmaking because it's something that I have continuously bitched about for almost two years now. Number one is CGI. Proper Subtle CGI can totally add to what you're doing, can totally work in a horror film, and can be completely successful at bringing a character or some kind of effect to life properly. Too much CGI will kill a horror film, and people, filmmakers in Hollywood, just seem to not get this through their skull. This was the main thing that bugged me about the 2017 film was the overuse and not even really all that great CGI that Andy Muschietti decided to put on Pennywise in so many sequences to me that just, it took all scare away from it. I'm not scared of a digital effect. When I can tell immediately that I'm watching a video game character walking around, it doesn't scare me. It doesn't scare me, it doesn't affect me at all. And if, even if I was tense before that effect came along, it's gone the second that I see it. And I'm gonna tell you, if you thought that the CGI was either distracting or bad or overutilized in the 2017 film, whew, hold on to your butts because god damn they overuse it in this film. Almost every single sequence that Pennywise shows up in, either his face morphs into CGI or they do that fucking run thing that he does, which is like Jacob's Ladder, must my hair up, or he transforms into something that's like the epitome of these adults' fears. Some of them are recycled from 2017, and it's a complete digital effect. You remember that scene you saw in the first trailer where Beverly's in her house and you have the creepy old lady who's like peeking out while she's making cookies and she does the weird little walk in the shadows and it's really effective and really creepy? And they cut away in the trailer before you actually see her, like you just see her legs kind of coming out to scare Bev. What is attached to those legs ruins that entire sequence. You literally could have just had that exact actress, that lady, even if she didn't want to appear nude, you could do effects or do shots with a body double to make that work. But just that lady in the way that they are portraying in that trailer and how it was cut would have been a thousand times more effective and 10,000 times more scary than whatever the fuck they decided to put on the screen in the actual film. Second cardinal sin of horror filmmaking. 
telegraphed jump scares. Jump scares have been around forever. That's one of the biggest defenses you will hear from jump scare apologists is that we've always had jump scares. The difference is false jump scares and telegraph jump scares will kill the tension and kill the scares in a horror film. And almost every single scare that this movie has in store for you is just wash, rinse, repeat, basic ass jump scares. Something happens, the music swells down, the camera focuses on somebody's face or something in the room, and when the camera starts to pan or when the camera moves or when that character steps out of the way, blah, scare. Every single one, I'm like, here it comes. Ah, there it is. When you have a character like Pennywise the Clown, when you have a actor as devoted and as physically capable as Bill Skarsgård to bring this terrifying creature to life, why in the fuck are you relying on basic bitch horror filmmaking techniques that you will find in any bullshit horror movie that comes out in January and February? Absolutely no excuse for that. And the third, the closing chapter of horror filmmaking sins, which Halloween 2018 really brought to the forefront for me as a sin, is the overuse and misuse of humor in a horror film. And while I said in my positives that the biggest thing that I loved about this film was Bill Hader, and one of the best things about his performance was his humor and his comedic timing, they use it way too much. And they use it in scenes where you should not be laughing. And it's not just Bill Hader. You have Eddie, you have other characters, you have music gags. I mean, they're straight out of Deadpool on some of them, where like it's a scare scene, it's supposed to be a tense scene, and they kill it instantly by throwing in a joke in times where no human fucking person would ever be cracking jokes or be laughing or be making quips. And it totally takes you out of the movie. Like there's scenes that are brilliant as far as the humor, especially with Bill Hader. And there's scenes where there's a joke thrown in and you might laugh, but immediately after you're like, why am I laughing at this? I'm supposed to be scared. Now moving on from the sins of this movie, the second act is a big standout for a negative in this film. And it kind of ties in with the runtime because the second act is what really pads out the runtime. The second act is basically all of these characters split up individually, going to a setting that calls back to their childhood, most of which are settings that we had seen in the previous film, the camera panning away from the adults, going to a flashback sequence with the child actor of that character, and enacting a scene that we did not see in the middle of the story of the first film. So it's kind of like pieces of the story that we weren't given. The problem with the way that they do it is that for one, it is in godly repetitive. Like you have like six or seven characters that do the exact same thing. And it's the exact same template, like I just described. They go to a place, they remember something about their youth. Usually in their youth, they get scared by Pennywise. They flash back to the adult, they get scared by Pennywise. They run away with some kind of token from their childhood. And then you go to the next character and they do the exact same thing. And the, it has no flow whatsoever. That's not like there's some impact from this character into the story that happens with this character, which bleeds into this character. It's literally like individual scenes that they probably could have put in any order for 45 minutes. And while some of them are cool, while some of them are effective, they're repetitive as all hell. And it makes the runtime and the pace of the film stand out like a sore thumb for that entire second act. The other problem is that they draw so much attention to how much better the kids were as far as this storyline than the adult characters are. And the main reason for that is because this entire second act is really all they give us aside from maybe a two, three minute intro to the characters in the first act as far as character development for these kids as they are adults. Nobody is the same when they're almost 40 as they were when they were 13. Nobody. You might have certain characteristics that are the same where you're obviously the same human being, but you're not the same person. And if you're a character in a movie, you're not exactly the same character. You've grown, you've changed, you've had trauma in your life, you've matured possibly. And we don't get that from any of these characters, which is part of the reason why the casting just doesn't quite land for me because the characters that these great actors are portraying just feel hollow. 
I don't latch onto them. I don't feel like I know them the way that I knew them when they were kids because all they do to develop them and who they are as their adults is remind us what they were like when they were kids, which just, that doesn't connect for me at all. I feel like I'm watching these characters and I don't care what happens to them because I don't feel like I know them. Now sticking with characters, there are a couple of characters that I will throw in the negative side. And the first one, unfortunately, is Eddie who was one of my favorite characters in the first movie. I thought that they portrayed that character so well. He was not as wimpy and whiny as he was portrayed in the 1990 film. So to me, he was much more of an entertaining character. He had a wit and a, a sharpness to his dialogue that could actually battle with Richie and they had a great back and forth throughout that entire film. I liked how he kind of triumphed over his fear by the end of that film where he was no longer as much of a hypochondriac, he threw away his fanny pack, he told off his mom about giving him gazebos. You get to this film, and partially because of the betrayal of the actor, partially because they revert back to him just being a wimpy hypochondriac, and that's all the character development we get of this guy, I could not stand his character in this movie. He was so fucking annoying to me. And a lot of that's because of the way he was portrayed. He had, he had no development from the time that he was a kid to the time that he was an adult. And the one thing that they give him as far as an arc in this film, he already triumphed in 2017. He already triumphed over the whole hypochondriac thing. So going back to that is repetitive. It was weird. I couldn't latch onto the character at all. They even recycle his fear with the leper. They don't even give him anything new to interact with in this film. So to me, Eddie, gigantic misstep. And the other one is the portrayal of Ben and Bev's relationship. Not necessarily the characters individually. I think Bev was done pretty okay. Ben, not as much, but just the relationship between these two characters, I felt was very weak. Like the whole storyline about the whole poem that he wrote her as a kid, you know, your hair is winter fire, January embers, my heart burns there too. They, that's all that Ben gets in this entire film is that, hey, I'm not fat anymore and I'm secretly in love with her, but I'm too scared to say anything. And there's so many sequences over and over, which really start to stand out in a negative way when you're sitting there for three fucking hours where Bev has like this little twinkly eye look every time she sees James McAvoy and Ben's over in the corner going, hmm. And the whole movie is just them doing that over and over. Ben just wanting so bad to tell her, but for whatever reason can't, even though he looks like fucking Brad Pitt now. And Bev being oblivious to it until they get this little dream sequence thing at the climax of the film where they finally realize, and it's just like, uh, okay, I guess they love each other now, but you've had no chemistry the entire film. You've had no development of that relationship the entire film. You barely even had any interaction throughout the film, aside from Ben just looking pouty because you love <laughs> James McAvoy so much, it didn't land. It didn't land for me at all. I didn't believe that they would end up together. I didn't believe that that poem would have such a power that they'd be like, you're my true love. And when they go off into the sunset together, I didn't care. I was like, whatever. Bye. And the last character that I'll talk about in a negative sense is Henry Bowers. Yep, surprise, he's back and he's stalking them as an adult that has escaped from an asylum. This was in the book, this was in the 1990 miniseries, and it's here and it's a complete waste. They change what happens with him escaping, I'm not gonna say how, but it completely neuters his effect in the story and it completely neuters his threat to the story. And by the end of his little arc in the second half, you're like, so where did, what, what purpose did that serve? That went absolutely nowhere. Now the big ones are out of the way, I have three minor nitpicks that I have with this film that to me, stand out more as a negative because of everything else. The first one has to do with the way they portray the kids, where there's a lot of flashback sequences in this film. I would say maybe even a third of this film still focuses on the younger versions of these characters. That might be generous, but it feels like it. They use this de-aging CGI effect on half of the kids because if they're two years older now, or they were a year or so or older from the time that they filmed it, however much, and some of them stand out and they are incredibly distracting. Namely, Finn Wolfhard as Richie. There's like this weird effect on his glasses that make his eyes look googly. Like, you know the whole face that Pennywise has where his face starts to like melt? Finn Wolfhard almost looks that way. And every scene that he's in, because he's gotten older, he's gotten taller. I mean, you can look at Stranger Things from season two to season three and see that this kid has grown a lot. And they try to mask that with CGI 
and it's just distracting. I think it almost would have been less distracting if they had just filmed the kids and just maybe put the camera a little higher or something. I'm not a filmmaker, I don't know. But the couple of kids that get that effect, it's very, very distracting. And for those that notice it, it will take you out of nearly every single scene that these kids are in. There's also a very notable lack of charm in this film that was very prevalent in the first half. A lot of that is just, it's the Achilles heel of the second half of this story. It's always more charming to see kids go against this evil than it is to see grown ass adults go against this evil. But even aside from that, there's just a lack of charm in the difference of eras. Where in the book you had the 50s and the late 80s, early 90s in the adult side of things. In this, they did you know a time shift obviously to where the kids were in the 80s and now the adults are in current times. But they don't really have any kind of charm, any kind of pop culture, any kind of music or anything to solidify the second half as being a 2000 and I think 16 is what it actually takes place in the movie, a 2016 story. Now, arguably that's that's hard to do and there's nothing iconic about now that you could really put into films and be like hey 2016 but the 80s side of things had pop culture references you had nightmare on Elm street 5 on the movie marquee you had new kids on the block posters you had music from that era you had clothes you had style you had attitudes from that era the portrayal of the bullies while being a little bit heavy-handed were 80s bullies there was so much that had charm and like this this nostalgic vibe to that first half. You get to this half and it just kind of feels lifeless. There's not really any music that stands out. There's not any style that stands out. There's nothing about it that feels like an iconic era at all. And it just, it's really noticeable, the lack of charm that is in the second half. And the last thing that I'm gonna touch on I highly debated not even bringing it up because it's a very sticky subject, but you guys know me, I talk pretty freely, I stand by what I say, and I go there when sometimes other people won't. So I feel like I should talk about this. Let me say this up front. I'm not bringing this up to offend anybody. So if you're offended by how I responded to this version of the story or how this portrayal of this character or this, this community of people in this film, I apologize and I promise you I don't mean any offense. I will also say I am not the person who should probably be saying this because I don't have, I'm not a part of the community so I don't exactly have the perspective to say accurately how this is going to be taken by that community. But it was done odd enough for me to where I feel like I at least need to mention it. There's a certain way that this movie decides to utilize the gay community that seems very odd when you look back on the film. I know that I've read that this is part of the book. I haven't actually read the book. I probably should have said that right away, but I haven't actually read the book, but I was told that this is the same opening in the book. So I guess they have that little bit of a get out of jail free card, but the movie opens up with a gay couple, two men getting viciously beaten getting called faggot numerous times, and one of them being tossed off to be murdered by Pennywise, which is a very strong, heavy-handed way to open this film. That's one part of it. Another part of it, which is something that I didn't even really pick up on while I was watching the film, there was something there that felt like I had a big question mark when I left, and it wasn't until I discussed the movie with somebody else and they brought up that they kind of thought this might have been going on, and I looked into it and it's actually confirmed. Richie, Eddie, or Eddie, <laughs> Bill Hader's character in the adult form, and in hindsight, the kid form as well, is portrayed in this film as a closeted homosexual. It's very, very, very subtle the way that they do it, almost to a point of being hidden, because there's a scene where Pennywise is talking to Richie and he threatens him with, do they know your secret? Can I tell them your secret? And that's what tipped me off about it after I left and I was thinking back on the film thinking they never told what his secret was. Towards the end of the film, when something happens in the third act, Richie has the most emotional reaction to it. And it felt to me like it was just the bond between those two characters. And that's how I took it. There's even a spot where he scrapes his initials into this bridge from when he was a kid and adds the initial of this other character. And again, I took it as just that strong of a friendship that was him remembering his friend. When I talked to somebody outside of the movie, after I had seen it to kind of compare notes, they said, did you notice that they kind of like were nodding that Richie and this other character may be a gay couple? And I was like, no, they didn't. 
they they were just they were just friends. I didn't pick up on that at all. That's uh, I, I didn't pick up on that. And after I went home, I started thinking about the whole thing that Pennywise was saying about your secret. And there's a scene whenever he's a kid where Bowers calls him a faggot and he runs away and starts crying. And I just took that as him being upset because he's being bullied. When you add all these pieces together, I did some digging and the writers and the director actually confirm it that Richie was being portrayed as a closeted gay character. And he was actually secretly in love with this other character that has this, you know, that falls in the third act. The issue with that is not that they tried to do it, and I have absolutely no problem whatsoever with having gay characters in movies or anything, so please do not say that down below. The problem is, I'm of the opinion, if you're gonna go there, go there. If you're gonna portray Richie as a gay character, make it apparent, make it a part of the plot, make it a part of his character arc. That's really an interesting direction to go with his character, this comedian that's been away from this guy that he's pretty much forgotten because he's outside of Derry for his entire life and he's been holding this in. And aside from going back and confronting Pennywise, he's kind of going back and confronting his own demons to a degree and confronting this person that he was secretly in love with. And then when you had this action, this act of sacrifice in the third act, it's so much more emotional if it's apparent. But it's not because they go so subtle with it and they go so almost scared to put too much in there that to me it feels like it has no purpose. And I don't know if you're a part of the gay community, if you like the fact that they just hint at it, if you like the fact that there's inclusion there to a certain extent, or if you agree with me and say that if you're gonna do it, do it, because that's not enough. Just doing it, just putting it in there, a little tiny nugget, a little 1% of something to chew on is not enough when you could do so much with that aspect of that character that, like I said, if you're gonna go there, go there. So. Maybe not a full-on negative, maybe that should be in the mixed category, but it's something I kind of wanted to end on because I wasn't sure while I was filming if I actually wanted to talk about it, but hopefully I brought that across as respectfully as possible. Uh, I, again, I apologize if I offend anybody by bringing that up, but in hindsight, it just seems like such an odd move, and they've done it in many movies before. They did it in Star Trek Beyond where they just kind of throw it in there, but they don't do anything with it as far as the character's arc or the character's storyline to where... I feel like if I was a part of that community, I would be more irritated that you didn't do anything with it versus just throwing it in there just to be able to say you threw it in there. But I don't know. I guess I'll find out down below if I'm right or wrong on that one. You know what? I lied. There's one more thing that I need to bring up, and this is very small. This is something that probably I'm the only person on YouTube who is going to bitch about this, but I seem to be the person most frustrated with this film thus far. This movie has a lot of balls with some of the things that it references. I'll start small and I'll, I'll move on my way to the big one. First of all, there's this whole plot thread that goes on with, uh, with Bill, with James McAvoy's character, where he's a writer and he's famous for writing a lot of stories and screenplays that get turned into movies that have shit endings. He's the guy who writes stories with shit endings. And they reference it even with Stephen King himself having a cameo saying, nah, I didn't like the ending to his book which to me felt directly like the writer and the director saying, don't worry, we have a good ending. Like almost poking fun at the fact that most people don't love the ending of It and especially don't love the ending of the 1990 miniseries. So it was kind of like them, you know, digging into the scab and saying, we got a better ending in store for you, but you don't. So to me, that was, you know, there by the end of the movie. The big one, there is a sequence in this film that some will call homage, some will call inspiration. I will call it straight up fucking ripoff of John Carpenter's The Thing, which most of you know is my favorite horror film of all time. There is a sequence involving a head that turns into a spider. And aside from the head not being upside down, it's literally taken directly from John Carpenter's The Thing as far as the design, as far as the legs coming out of the head, and to me, while some people might look at that and go, oh sweet, a Thing reference. To me, it was fucking insulting in this movie because The Thing is famous, has a legacy for being quite possibly the greatest example of practical effects in a horror film. And quite possibly the greatest argument that you can have for why practical effects are always more effective and much more iconic 
and much better, especially in a horror film, than CGI effects. And they reference that film in a movie that is caked on completely heavy with CGI effects and doesn't have the balls or the fucks to give or the effort to try to use practical effects whatsoever. They say, nah, we got $80 million this time. Let's just throw it into computer effects. To me, that pissed me off. So while a lot of people, I've even had people say, you must have loved the thing reference, right? Actually, it pissed me off. So <laughs> that might be the only time you hear that from anybody who's reviewing this film, but the thing reference can go fuck itself in IT Chapter 2. But overall, guys, I'm sure this was a long review. I'm, I'm dreading the length, the runtime I'm going to run into once I get done editing this thing, but sorely, severely disappointed in this portrayal of IT Chapter 2. There's things that they did right. I thought Bill Hader was great. I thought the set design was great. I thought that, you know, the, the balls to go there and actually show child death was cool, but almost every single other aspect of this film was just a letdown for me. It was either just kind of flatlined and just okay, or full-on infuriating bad. And that is so disappointing with how well they executed the first half of this film. And it just makes me wonder if maybe they shot themselves in the foot by doing two separate films. I can't remember if Kerry Fukunaga wanted to do... He got kicked off the project because his budget was too heightened. I think he might have wanted to shoot both back to back or something. And if that's true, I think that would have been the better way to go about it because you could have gotten rid of the whole de-aging thing. You could have had these extra scenes with the kids already filmed. You could have weaved these stories through a little bit more. You didn't have to leave like the casting of the adult characters as like this cool little secret that we'll talk about in a year. And the movie would have been better for it because there's so much that they could have done to develop these characters simultaneously like they do in the novel and like they do in the 1990 miniseries where the adults wouldn't feel flat. It wouldn't feel like they had to pad out the runtime with things that don't really drive the plot forward because the second half of the story is much more basic than the first half of the story. And you could have just kept the charm and kept the tone and kept the direction consistent throughout both halves of the story where it feels like here they executed the first one pretty damn well with the exception of the CGI. They got ungodly amounts of money. They got cocky and they got lazy. The movie's budget got more than doubled and they went crazy and spent that money willy nilly on the fucking CGI when they could have done so much more with that money as far as sets, as far as big, huge set pieces and sequences. And it just went to computer generated characters that to me was one of the biggest downfalls of the second half of this story. So. Overall, maybe I'll like it more upon rewatch, but as of right now, this is a huge contender for most disappointing film that I've seen this year in a very mediocre year. Please. So if you're a fan of the novel, the miniseries, or the first film from 2017, I do think the second half is worth watching just so you can get closure on these characters and see how everything ends. But go in with lowered expectations, go in expecting a very padded runtime, and go in expecting that the portrayal of these characters in their adult years is not nearly as charming or effective as it was in their kid years. So with all that being said, save your money, check it out online, and stream it. So what did you guys think of IT Chapter 2? Did you love this movie? I have seen people that say they love it even more than the first part, which is crazy to me, but that's the beautiful thing about movies. We all have different experiences, I guess. We all take things in a different way. So are you part of that camp? Did you absolutely hate this movie? Do you actually prefer the second half of the 1990 miniseries? I won't quite say that, but there's certainly parts of it that I prefer, which is scary to think that is actually a reality. But let me know down below what your thoughts on IT Chapter 2, and do you want them to do another one? I've heard rumblings that they want to do maybe IT Chapter 3 or explore some more of it, which I think would be a mistake, but do you want that? Let me know down below. Let's talk about some IT Chapter 2. Also, please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. If you guys want to check out some social media links, check the video description below for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, my Patreon page, which is a great way to give back to this channel, help this channel grow, and get cool exclusive content for your eyes only if you decide to become a patron. And just below that is my Teespring store, which has all of my merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, bags, stickers, all that cool stuff with all of the great, awesome designs by Woody Bowen. So check that out down below, guys. And if you want to check out some more of my reviews, including my review of both the 1990 miniseries and the 2017 film, you can check those out by clicking right over here.